Hello and welcome to the show. I am Rahim Nwali. Today we speak about a very fundamental, basic human right, the right to education. It is important for us as a country and we thought it would be very, very important that we have this conversation. And we are honored to be hosting the spokesperson of the Ministry of Education and Sports, Dr. Dennis Mojimba. Dr. Dennis, thank you so much for accepting to speak with us. Thank you so much, Rahim, for inviting us. I wanted us to start from really you painting for us a picture of the state of our education in the country. Thank you. Um, if I can use one phrase, I can say it is on the right trajectory. Why? Because of the investments that have been put in the sector over time by the government, and we are beginning to see the fruit coming out. And the investments are cross-cutting from the lowest level, that is the pre-primary, up to higher education. We have also experienced what we call a lot of attention from the public, which I think is very good for us, um, because we look at the public as our mirror, we get free feedback. So what we are hearing from the public is like a dashboard to us. It tells us where we ought to be. Now, you should always get concerned as an organization if you are not being talked about. So it is very healthy for us. I, we are able to identify areas of improvement, what we are doing, what we need to do, uh, continue doing well, and areas that we need to improve in. Uh, looking at, uh, apart from that, we experiencing favor from government in that our financing has been relatively stable as a ministry. If you look at the last five, seven years, we've not experienced significant budget cuts whereby we feel like we are crippled, we cannot do anything. So that is good for us because largely um, we depend a lot on the ability because we are very conservative. We are not yet at a level as a sector where we are productive in terms of uh, generating revenue. I'll come to that later. Why am I saying that? We are looking at a future where the higher education research output is translated into marketable products. And that can be a source of revenue for the country. We are not yet there. Yes, uh, you mentioned something around yes. relevance. Yes. And I, I meet a lot of people, mm -hmm. and I think I'll be speaking for so many when, when I pose this question, yes. whether you quite honestly believe that we are still relevant, especially compared to the rest of the world, the kind of system that we go in. And do, do you think that we are relevant indeed, like you said? There is a context within which relevance plays out. And as a country, we believe that, first of all, we have to be relevant to ourselves. It does no good for you to be relevant to outsiders and you're irrelevant to your home. Why, what is the biggest indicator we see? For example, in Tibet, we are seeing a huge swell of enrollment in, our, in the Tibet institutions the 142 public institutions and the over 700 private Tibet institutions. Mm -hmm. Now to us, the, 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 the Tibet sub sector mm -hmm. is a very, very powerful indicator mm -hmm. of uh, relevance to the local context because these young people that get skilled there, they go out and find a job. Now, if we were not relevant, no one would be coming in for Tibet. But in just the last three years, uh, two years when we especially adopted the decentralized admission system into the Tibet institutions, whereby if Dr. Mjimba wants to train in, let's say, uh, motor vehicle mechanics, instead of having, previously you would have to apply through the joint admissions board. But now you actually go to the Tibet institution simply fill in an application form and choose the institution within your locality that you want to go to. We are not the ones to post you. You choose where you want to go. Now we've seen enrollment demand 
increased by more than 150 percent. Mm -hmm. We have seen the demand from females increase by 120 percent. Now, if there was no relevance of the skills acquired in our Tibet institutions, definitely you would get feedback through low demand. The other good signal that our education system is very relevant is when we look at the demand for higher education. We are seeing an increase in enrollment in higher education as well. We are seeing increase in uh, secondary school education. The biggest gauge for us is when we open the seed schools. The seed schools, these are public schools, brand new, that are located one in a sub-county. Whenever we open the gates, immediately capacity is hit. So yes, someone outside may judge and say that what you're giving is not relevant, but actually the people who are the immediate market is the community within which you live. The fact that they are still demanding an education within our system, and also foreign students coming to Uganda, we are still getting a huge number of demand from the region coming into our education system. It really shows that what Uganda has is still relevant. Are there conversations around um, answering some questions like the 8%, 80% of, uh, um, I think that post graduate unemployment in this country, especially that these are young people from the system who get out and then there's this huge level of unemployment in the country and then other numbers and it is just a cycle. Are there some conversations around how to mitigate? Yes, thank you that you've asked in the, about that area. We got, uh, I got an opportunity to, to sit in when the National Planning Authority was making submissions to the Education Policy Review Commission chaired by Onaibamanya Mushega and one of the revelations that came out is that um, though we've experienced uh, decades of uh, economic growth as a country, that has not translated to a demand for jobs. Now, the demand for jobs is driven by the industry. So for you to look at employment, the, the challenge in Uganda is not supply it is actually, the, the demand side is actually very low. So that is why the president's prioritization of industry, having investors, local and foreign, that can establish industry here in different sectors is actually the right direction because however much we, pr we produce, not everyone will be able to move out of the country into green pastures. So the challenge sometimes, I can say that it's beyond the education ecosystem, it is more of the general ecosystem of our economy. We need to be able to have the employers, the investors, the industries that will be able to demand for the jobs that our people are trained for. So it's not like our training is irrelevant, not so. It is actually the, we don't have enough demand from within. In some of the solutions to mitigate this? One is we have to be relevant in our education to the global market. We should not just train for Uganda. Exactly, that's yes. why I asked yes. you at the very beginning. Yes, we should not train just for Uganda. We should train for the region. And when we were coming up with the revised lower secondary curriculum, it was a very radical, <laughs> there was a very radical proposal on table. It was a very radical, the initial draft was very radical. Then the president advised and said, you know, uh, let's first position ourselves within the context of East Africa. Let's first tap into the East African market. So we had actually to tweak our curriculum to align ourselves with the market that surrounds us. Mm -hmm. So as a sector, one of the things we have to emphasize is training in the language of Kiswahili, mm -hmm. because we have to tap within the region. And language is the, uh, Kiswahili, just like any language, is the communication of commerce. Number two, we have to ensure that we align the competences that our learners acquire when in the system to those that are required in the global industry. Okay, uh, computer literacy, critical thinking, 
problem solving, okay, ICT skills, all that has to be embedded. So when you look at uh, the lower secondary curriculum, that's why we are calling it competence-based. And the same concept has actually been rolled out into the TVET system, the technical vocation education training. So that is what, how we are repositioning ourselves. So that if Mujimba decides to leave Uganda and go to a foreign market, where foreign is even outside the East African market, in the broader African global markets, you should be able to be reskilled. You should be having the fundamentals. So that is very, very key for us. I love that you also mentioned um, some of the requirements that this would heavily um, take for us to get there. Yeah. And you mentioned something like ICT, you know, and this calls for infrastructure. Yes. Now, the country that we all live in speaks to the levels of low infrastructure, especially in our country. How is this going to be affected for schools that cannot even afford infrastructure like buildings to have ICT machinery? to educate and you know, give these schools to, the, uh, to their students? About, for about uh, 10 years, we've had a partnership with um, the Uganda Communications Commission. And over a thousand schools have benefited from having the hardware of computers installed, plus the energy source to have those computers run. Now, that step also enabled us to have the learners in our system trained. With the new uh, schools that we are building, we got clear guidance from the minister, First Lady Janet Museveni, that when we are building new schools going forward, we should build complete and comprehensive skill, uh, schools. That means the school should have staff quarters, at least six classrooms to start with, six staff houses, science labs that are fully equipped, ICT labs that are fully, it's a ICT lab that is fully equipped, a library, etc. Now that is going forward. We have also invested in training the human resource, the teachers, and ensuring that where we do not have uh, the hydropower, we invest in solar, and we've done that. However, we, there is still a lot to be done, especially in the secondary subsector, where some of the secondary schools we are constructing, because they are in the places that are very rural and remote, they are off the national grid. So that means in our planning for energy requirements in our schools, we have to rely on the renewables. We have not yet gone down to the primary subsector level. But for the secondary subsector, which is very critical, in the lower revised lower secondary curriculum, Training in ICT skills is very key. Mm -hmm. Now, why am I concentrating a lot on the secondary subsector, especially all level? Uh, basic education, as you go higher, because basic has both primary and all level. Mm -hmm. As you step into the grades for all level, mm -hmm. you're being grounded in the basic sciences, physics, chemistry, and biology. Mm -hmm. Of course, you also have the natural science of math, now, the reason why ICT is very strong in that area, because it sets a, a base for you to be able to get gainful training when you move into TVET. If you move into any ICT area, once you're grounded in those four spaces, you should be good to go, especially physics and mathematics. Now, the investment we are also making in TVET, technical vocation education training, is to ensure that these institutions have functional ICT labs. We equip them with the computers, we equip them with the human resource that is able to train. And of course, for the higher education, it's a no brainer. So we are making progress, but we are again, as I said, constrained by factors that are outside the education ecosystem. We need to be able to have energy. So if there is no energy source around, then we have to spend more money and depending on renewables but of course the cheapest would have to be hydropower that would require um, obviously teachers and the human resource that you mentioned mm -hmm. and there are so many inconsistencies around teachers payment mm -hmm. and how does this affect the, the the plan that you have and how do you plan on mitigating that kind of problem especially that 
so many of them come out, so many of them have changed, COVID-19 taught us that so many of them went into doing other businesses and left the industry. What are the plans for teachers in, in, in this whole plan? Where do they lie? Teachers are very central to our success as an education system because the presence of a teacher or an instructor or a lecturer adds a lot of value to the learning process. So what we have done is to ensure that we motivate these people through the, you, you, the public has heard a lot about pay, but that is not the only way to motivate them. I've talked about uh, welfare in terms of staff housing. We've ensured that that is there. We are investing in uh, having professional, professionalizing the teacher. What do I mean? We want to position the teacher as in the dimension of the lawyer, the medical, where you feel proud and you feel that you're regulated. We need to know who is getting in. Not everyone will be coming through. And that's why in 2019, we came in with the national teacher policy. Now, the national teacher policy provides for, among others, establishing uh, a national teacher qualifications framework. So that means that the qualifications you get when you're within the country, we can easily create for you to know where you match and also mobility of your talent for both those who are within and also outside. But we're also able to set what are the learning outcomes for you when you join the teaching profession. And you'll also be made aware that this is what we expect of you. We have also determined what competences are needed of a teacher. Now, this language was not familiar five, ten years ago, okay? And all this is part of the national teacher policy. Then uh, we've also defined very clear career paths. For example, there is leadership and management, there is uh, inspection, there is uh, the classroom teacher, there's special needs, there's early childhood. So once you have clarity of career paths, that alone should be motivating. All of us are not looking to be in policy positions. Everyone does not necessarily have to be uh, a, a head teacher. So there is going to be clarity of uh, career paths. Then there is also holding people accountable to the ethical code of conduct. And with that, we hope that by July, everything will be in place to have the National Teacher Council as the regulator of the teaching profession. This means that even the courses that are offered in the teacher training institutions are going to be of high standard. There's nothing that will be inferior. So the regulator of higher education member is the National Council for Higher Education. But just like the other professional bodies, the Law Council, the Uganda Medical Dental Practitioners Council, they provide advisory input to the work done by inter in the spaces of those areas which they regulate professionally. So in this respect, we shall also have the National Teacher Council giving that professional advisory input to the work being done by the National Council for Higher Education. So once we have defined the policy environment within which the teaching profession is practiced, that alone added with other hard issues, you know, welfare, it is being handled in a, uh, salaries, it's being handled in a phased manner. We are starting with the science professionals within the profession, but the president has made the commitment that as revenues stabilize, we are also going to get to the humanities. Right now there's some disgruntlement and it's understandable because we are human beings, but it will, it will be addressed in a phased manner. So it will not happen anytime soon? it will be handled in a phased manner. That's what I'll say. Whereby, th there's a lot that again happens within that. Um, one, we are not going to borrow money to pay salaries. We have to rely on our taxes. So what you do not want, Rahim, is to engage in starting new projects all the time, touching too many things all the time. Stabilize, look at the grounds you have consolidated, and then as revenues improve, you touch other areas. By the way, all this is being done in respect to 
also handling other areas of teacher motivation. As I talked about earlier on, I mentioned the element of every secondary school we are beginning, we are putting up staff houses. We are also doing it in Tivet. Mm -hmm. Now on uh, National Teachers Day last year, mm -hmm. the first lady made the pronouncement that going forward, every school construction project we get in as a ministry, staff accommodation has to be key. So now that is a sign of hope for the profession. All right, Dr. Mujimba, a report by the Auditor General shocked all of us over with over 609 ghost teachers that have, had been on payroll for over 39 years. Mm -hmm. And this had obviously caused us a total loss of about 19 billion. Mm -hmm. This was shocking for you as well, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And uh, the Auditor General actually got prompting from the Education Service Commission, which is under the Ministry of Education and Sports. Prior to that, the First Lady had been getting very strong feelers that we had ghost teachers in the service. So she commissioned the Education Service Commission to go out and do a human resource audit of all staff. For example, all the staff that that's a good number, most of the staff are recruited by the local governments, the district service commissions. Then uh, for us, we are responsible for uh, the diploma awarding institutions and higher, touching not higher education institutions, universities are self-governing. Then we also are responsible for the secondary schools. So the, the loophole has been at the local government level because Rahim, the, these schools are within a locality called the local government. Even for the employees that are hired or posted or transferred by the ministry, the local government is involved in all this. There is an office in the local government called the personnel office or human resource office. And we've received a lot of outcry that that is a hotbed of malpractice. Because for people to get on the payroll, it's not the cow that sits and punches people's names in the payroll. Sometimes there's a time the first lady met with the, cow, uh, with the head teachers and they themselves complained that they are not receiving monthly payrolls to know whom they are paying for or who is being paid under their account. And a decision was taken that every month the head teacher should be given the payroll so that they know which staff has been paid under them. So as long as you have these pockets, everyone is hiding information from the other, then you're going to have ghosts mushroom because there is absolutely no way a teacher can get on a payroll. Even a head teacher cannot put anyone on payroll. You cannot, the ministry cannot sit and put a, a primary school teacher on a payroll. All this is done somewhere, most of it within the local government setting. So if you fix the issues of recruitment and have people get on the payroll in that human resource office at the local government, you will wipe out all these ghosts. So the ministry currently has no answer to that. It just has to be you know, done somewhere yeah, no, no, we have, to, we have a share in that, solving this problem. One is streamlining our processes, okay, at the ministry. Because some of the uh, accusations we've also received is that some individuals within the ministry are part of this whole racket of getting people into the payroll because they are using false documents, and these false documents bear signatures or purported signatures of people at the ministry. And there are people who are willing to come and, and volunteer this witness information. So I am sure if the Auditor General hands over these cases to police, you can get people arrested. So there has to be an investigation. Someone has to be willing to hand over that Auditor General's report. Okay. Yes. And good enough, we've had them cleaned out. After the Education Service Commission has, uh, conducted the investigation that was commissioned by the First Lady, over 600 teachers in secondary schools were removed from the payroll because they were illegal. 
Okay. We earlier mentioned about uh, the new curriculum. And there was an answered question. Um, for example, what would happen to students who had, you know, sort senior four and maybe failed or even didn't sit exams and how that would accommodate them within the new system? And I think that the answers were not clear. For you talking of the... When we are having a new curriculum, the revised law secondary curriculum, that had been running alongside with the old curriculum. Now, for the learners who are continuing, I happen also to sit on the National Curriculum Development Center Governing Council. Our understanding is that there is no need for a learner who does not perform well in uh, the old curriculum, whose UCE was sat last year, for that learner now to go back to senior one, okay? Because the amount of change in, that new, in the revised lower curriculum is not so exhaustive to require someone to begin afresh in senior one. So there will have to be a transition arrangement because remember, part of the assessment for passing is that 20% is continuous and 80% is the final the summative assessment, the UCE exams. Now, there is going to be a transition arrangement that we shall have to come up with as a ministry to guide on how to handle that, because what we are saying is that the learner should not go back to senior one if you do not perform well. So that parents should not fear about that. You're not going to send your learner back to senior one. What the ministry is going to pronounce itself on is now, how do we cater for the 20%? that you're supposed to have accumulated as continuous assessment because definitely the learners who, the last cohort of the old lower secondary curriculum was in this last November, December last year exams and they definitely did not undertake the continuous assessment. So we'll see, we'll recommend how to go about that. And I'm sure maybe a way forward may, may come when the minister is releasing results so that everyone is comforted on the way forward. Let's speak about reality. Yes. Um, the huge gap between the haves and the have-nots, mm -hmm. and especially within the sector, uh, we see children go to school, you know, and studying under trees, and these children and pupils are meant to compete with pupils going to Kampala International and all these, you know, big schools around for the same, and compete for the same job market. What are some of these conversations that are being had about education, indeed as a service, not as a business? It's good that you've raised that. Um, there's a time I was in a meeting with uh, some top leaders of the ministry, and some people were arguing <laughs> that what matters is a good curriculum, where the learner is learning from is not as important. And the minister was saying, look, the quality of infrastructure where the learner is learning from contributes a lot to the learning experience. So as government, we are investing a lot through the education sector in infrastructure development. We have a facility called the School Facilities Grant. In the last two financial years, we have disbursed to local governments over 162 2 billion, to be exact, 163 billion. 80 billion in the previous financial year, then 83 billion in the most recent financial year. This money is supposed to improve on existing infrastructure. It's not to build new schools. This is if you have, a, a, you don't have desks, buy desks. If you do not have a blackboard, put up a blackboard. Facelift the school replace the roof, ETC. This money is disbursed to the districts. Those districts that are using that money judiciously, you see a progress within the quality of the infrastructure. However, Rahim, what we have found is that there is democratization of management of limited resources in the local governments. So you get 700 million to renovate to, through the school facilities grant in your local government. 
and you want to distribute that 700 million to the 100 schools you have. So what is that little money going to do within that 100 schools that you have? The best thing would be for you to have a strategic plan of intervention as a local government to say, this year we are going to attend to 10 most critical schools in infrastructure. And by the way, you also use that money to put up sanitation facilities. Then next year, we shall have another 10, another 20, ETC. For example, the other day I was asking, the KCC alone has received at least 1.2 billion per year in the last two financial years for school facilities grants. They have 80 primary schools. It would be good for you to ask the councillors of Kampala City Authority, which schools have you attended to with this 2.4 billion in the last two financial years? How many schools have, because right now, for example, districts that have managed that school facilities grant well, you should not be having the issue of learners sitting on the floor in a classroom. That money is a lot to just have every classroom with uh, desks. Now you go to the element of uh, new schools, or a school is completely dilapidated and the school facility is not enough. In the last five years, we've built at least 150 primary schools. Now these are not necessarily new, but you come to this school, you find the infrastructure is just completely run down. It's been temporary shelter. So we've put up permanent classes in over 150 primary schools. We are also working on secondary schools. Just to give you more information on the school facilities grant, government has been able to put up more than 700 classrooms in existing schools, where we come and find that enrollment in this school exceeds the capacity of the existing infrastructure. So we put up additional classrooms. We've done that, over 700 classrooms. In secondary schools, I've talked about the uh, over 100 seed schools that we have commissioned just in the last year alone as seed schools. We are also working, there's a project that is also working on existing secondary schools to ensure that the existing classrooms are increased in capacity. Then uh, you've also had uh, the first lady talk about the need for us to rehabilitate the traditional schools, these legacy schools, the schools that have been around, most you and I probably went through those schools that have served this country very well for the last 70, 80 years. Now, government is trying to raise resources to ensure that we renovate these schools, we expand their capacity in terms of classroom space, because remember these schools were built for a capacity of around 400 students, but right now they have over 1,000 and those learners need space. So government has all this in plan. As we talk right now for the TVET subsector, we are putting up, we've worked on over 30 vocational training institutes around the country. As I talk right now, eight of them, and it's all scattered all around the country, Ogolai Technical Institute in Amuria, Lokopio Hills in Yumbe, uh, Buhimba Technical Institute in uh, Chikuve District, that many, we are putting up more capacity. Dormitories for students, we are putting up uh, lecture rooms, workshops, etc. These are not new technical institutes. They are old institutes that, whose infrastructure had run down. So government is investing within the available resources to ensure that we improve the quality of infrastructure because we believe that once you have good infrastructure, the learning experience definitely improves. And of course, you saw uh, in the last two years, uh, the minister commissioning new facilities at, Ch at Chambogo, at Makere University, Mbara University, MOOBs, also improving the uh, quality of infrastructure within the higher education public institutions. So we are doing something as a ministry. Is it what we want to do ultimately? Is it a hitting that level, not yet, but we are on the right trajectory and pleased at that. Are, are you also looking at the fee structures? If, if you're a social media, mm -hmm. which I believe you are a person, you will obviously wake up to you know, uh, bank statements and requirements from schools and, and the huge sums of money that some schools are, are requiring parents to pay. Is, does this give you sleepless nights? 
It is painful uh, to see what is happening, especially within the public institutions. Let me come to that. Why? For example, we have about 105 secondary schools and uh, they are receiving money from the taxpayer, from the consolidated fund. We pay payroll, we build their infrastructure. We have some investment we really put in those schools. But again, they are the, among the most expensive schools. Yeah. So there's a contradiction. And what cabinet decided in March last year is that because we came up when the, with this all outcry, we were requested by our minister to come up with a unit cost of implementing completely free universal education, whereby free means for those items which government is funding, a parent should not be required to contribute towards that. For example, if you are meeting, meeting the payroll bill, then you should not be asked to contribute towards contract staff. If we are paying for infrastructure development, you should not be paying development fee in a public school that is receiving public funds. So we have come up with that cost and we have presented it and cabinet approved it. We found that for primary universal primary education, we need a unit cost of around 225,000 shillings. For secondary, we need 984,000. Now, the cost of running a secondary school is really high because of the scope of the subjects, it is complexity of the material there. So we have presented that to cabinet. The good news is that cabinet approved and directed the Minister of Finance to raise 309 billion shillings for next financial year beginning July to help us provide free universal primary education. So one of the biggest cost drivers, the most expensive cost drivers in primary schools is actually teachers. Because when you don't post enough teachers to these schools, they, they have the learners, they feel compelled to raise money to pay the teachers from school fees because they don't have any other source of income, especially these public schools. Then, so if we can bridge that gap and the bulk, almost 60, 65%, with this 309 billion is actually going to recruiting over 70,000 new teachers. So once this money comes in, we shall have to engage with our local government to ensure that we recruit teachers. Then government is also going to invest in providing adequate instructional materials, adequate textbooks. We have also factored in a generous uh, am amount of money that needs to be spent on utilities in these schools. And we've also taken into consideration that government will not, and mark this, government will not be paying for feeding of children in schools. We are not yet at that level of affording it. So if you send your child to a boarding school, then that cost of boarding will purely be on you. Now, in secondary schools, the largest cost driver is actual accommodation, secondary schools. So those are some of the realities we have. Now, does it hurt us? Does it give us sleepless nights? It gives us sleepless nights, but not out of anxiety, but thinking of solutions. And in private schools? It, uh, in private schools. Now, what cabinet also uh, proved in March 2023 uh, 20, is what you'd call charges that are not allowable as fees. Uh, things like uh, collect, contributing, ask, asking parents to contribute to teachers' circles, uh, examination fees. What is authorized is an examination fee that is paid to an accredited national examination or assessment body. Okay? So, collect, charging parents to collect uh, for fees for district mocks ETC, that will be no more. Then you also have charges like development fees, but now this is not even development for a classroom. You, the people are being charged, parents are being charged collect money to build offices for a foundation body. So all that, there's a, a whole raft of items, about 12 of them, that have been labeled unallowable, in, wow. even in private, pub, private schools. Yes, you, you mentioned yes. something, which is obviously one of your mandate to mm -hmm. regulate. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you know, parents have to pay, for example, feeding costs. Mm -hmm. 
but the regulation mm. is 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 what is lacking how do you regulate certain things for example this is the cap under which private schools mm. can be able to request for school fees mm. and that way it is affordable for all of us given the fact that there are points a cut off points in schools and, and then you know my child didn't perform well so they cannot go to certain school a but also school fees is becoming a huge problem i think rahim what we there is different ways we can regulate the school's fees space. The best practice is actually for government to provide alternative and affordable source, uh, services of accessing, uh, rather service points for accessing education. That is the best practice. You let the private sector provide, but you also provide an alternative as government. And we are doing that. The mainstream or hallmark intervention is the primary school per parish, secondary school per sub-county. Because we believe that when we have an alternative, it will purely regulate the prices, okay? Because there is an alternative for those who, who are demanding for the service. Mm -hmm. Number two, we have come up with what is unallowable charges within the school. And I've elaborated on those 12 items that cabinet passed in uh, March 2023. Now, what the public wants <laughs> is for government to set a cap, to say uh, you cannot charge beyond this. However, before government steps into intervening in prices of goods and services, you must be very careful because you could be getting into a Pandora and the consequences may be far-reaching. You see, I have just talked about how government is not making a direct input in the cost of feeding children at school. Mm -hmm. So if you tell Mujimba High School that you cannot charge more than 400,000 for accommodation, but yet Mujimba has to buy food I have to pay workers who are cooking meals for the, I have to pay the utensils, etc. It is a whole supply chain that has to be managed when you talk about feeding children. But government is not the one regulating those prices. The prices for the inputs in school operations are managed by the market forces of supply and demand. So when you come in as government and begin setting caps and yet you are not in control. You've left the forces, market forces, to regulate the prices of the inputs. You are going to cause a distortion. So we have to be very, very careful about setting caps. However, we think that as government, just like what cabinet has done, if we follow through by ensuring that the disallowables are not charged on parents, if we ensure that free education is offered within, free university education is in, uh, provided within the primary schools for government, secondary schools for government, that should be a very great equalizer. We have seen it where we open the seed schools. We have actually gotten requests from private schools that government takes over schools in sub-counties where we have opened seed schools. Why? Enrollment has suddenly dropped in the private schools because learners have migrated to the public schools that are much more affordable. So the, the, the mainstay intervention of government of establishing a public primary school in a parish, a public secondary school in a sub-county, that is the most sustainable long-term intervention in managing school fees. However, a knee-jerk reaction of setting caps may have far-reaching effects and impact in beyond the education system. And before that is done, I think the economists and the executive needs to sit down and think through it. Uh, it may be a battlefront that may be very costly. Let me take you a little bit back to the welfare of, 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 uh, of pupils and uh, the delayed um, sexuality education um, um, framework that has for over 22 years now been tabled and has never been passed. And what are some of those repercussions that we are seeing? And why is this taking this long? In 2018, the first lady launched the sexuality education framework. And 
this I think was around August 2018. It was formulated by the ministry after what we felt was extensive consultation with the stakeholders. And the most sensitive segment of stakeholders were the foundation bodies and religious leaders, as well as parents, but mainly the foundation bodies because a good number of schools, uh, public schools are religious founded. Now, there came a debate on what would be the best mode of implementation. Some wanted it implemented within, integrated within the curriculum. Others wanted it implemented uh, separate, as a separate track. Number two, they arose discontent within the language and age appropriateness of some information that was in the sexuality education framework, in spite of the fact that we had done what we felt was extensive uh, consultation. Now, as those uh, deliberations were going on and now coming to another round of consensus, this was around end of 2019, COVID-19 hit in 2020. Now, we went ahead and launched the revised lower secondary curriculum. However, there are certain bits and pieces of knowledge, of information, which are not necessarily the full-blown sexuality education framework that was values-based, hinged on what we believe is the best uh, value system for this country. There are some bits and pieces that were packaged within the uh, knowledge, especially in biology, for uh, the lower, revised lower secondary curriculum. There are plans to also revise the primary level curriculum. Perhaps other pieces will be there. But because of the sensitivity of the topic and uh, let me say religious sensitivities of the topic and also cultural beliefs about uh, sexuality education, having it implemented the way we had perceived when we launched it in 2018 was not as straightforward as many would have wanted it to be. Okay. I think lastly, um, the effort, I remember in 2016 during President Museveni's campaign, he promised to um, deliver menstrual um, you know, hygiene to pads to children. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, the minister, Janet Katam Seven, seemed not to agree that this was a solution or it was even doable. And there was an option of the reusable pads, which obviously she again didn't agree with, um, citing that budgets were not enough. What are some of these efforts and, and what does this speak to? I think uh, having the pleasure of having worked with Mama Janet Museven for this long, one of the things that I've appreciated about her is that she's a stickler for interventions that are sustainable. The intention is good of providing sanitary towels to the young people in the education system when they come to school. But her question which she wants answered is, it should be done in a sustainable manner, not a one-off. So almost every year, she keeps on meeting people who bring proposals on what can be done. But most of these are one-offs. And she's, she has been very resolute. Can it be sustainable? Can you set up plant here? So all these discussions are going on in the background, but her desire is that for us to go that direction, let it be sustainable. Let it not just be a one-off intervention. So yes, the manifesto commitment of 2016 is not lost. It is now working through the gymnastics of how to bring it to realization. Is it slow? I mean, obviously these are good ideas, but <laughs> yes. the fact that they, they, they still take time yes. and there's that time yes. and there's someone leaving school, there's yes. someone not going to school yes. because of absenteeism and they cannot afford these mm -hmm. pads, mm -hmm. obviously informs and, and the, the future of this country, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of has an impact that from your end, you seem to, let's first create the solution, uh, sustainability, 
but then the reality on ground is, is a bit different. Now, it is better for you to do something patiently but sustainable than be hurried in your approach and do things that cannot be sustained. And by the way, it is not the only place that we have had to delay intervention. For example, there was also uh, a pledge to establish a technical vocational institution in every constituency. But when we sat down and worked, we decided, look, we are guided politically that let us first ensure that the 142 public uh, Tibet institutions are operational and are of quality. Then the next phase will be, let's ensure that every district will have at least one uh, technical vocation institution. Then there we can go to constituencies. So the vision is not lost. What we have to work around is the gymnastics of sustainable implementation of these uh, interventions. Dr. Mjima, thank you so much for speaking to us. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. I've been speaking to Dr. Mjimba Dennis, who is the spokesperson for the Ministry of Education and Sports. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. My name is Rahim Nwali, and thank you. Thank you.